So as some of you probably know, Washington really never wanted to be president. Um, there are a lot of times he says that he doesn't want to do things like, oh, I don't, I don't want to be commander in chief. I'm just going to show up to the Continental Congress in uniform to suggest that maybe it's a good idea. But when he says he doesn't want to be president, he really means he doesn't want to be president. He knows that there's only one direction for his reputation to go, and that's down. He has a pretty good sense about the challenges that are going to face the first president. He does not really particularly want to leave Mount Vernon. Keep in mind, he was gone for eight years during the war. And he was pretty convinced that he was going to die like any day because the men in his family didn't live for very long. And so he was constantly writing about, you know, any day could be his last, quite morbid actually. We would, we would find it a little bit ridiculous today with modern medicine and all that. So not long into his first term, he started thinking about how he wanted to leave and how he wanted to retire at the end of the term. And in 1792, while he and Madison were starting to sort of disagree on most policy matters, he was still talking to Madison. Madison was still an advisor. And he requested that Madison come and meet with him and uh, didn't really say in the letter what it was about. So he just said, you know, the president requests Mr. Madison's, uh, the, the privilege of Ms. Mr. Madison's um, uh, acquaintance at breakfast tomorrow morning. And just like today, when the president summons you, you show up. So Madison showed up. And Washington told him that he wanted to retire and he wanted Madison to draft an address and to discuss with him what would be the best way to share this address publicly. Madison made the recommendation that it be published in a newspaper because it would be speaking directly to the American people. He suggested he do this instead of, for example, um, you know, delivering it to Congress and then having it dispersed from there. It was, it was a better idea to try and get it to as many readers as possible so that the president was speaking to the American people. Madison initially protested and said, no, you can't retire. There's no way you can leave. The country needs you. You're the only person that can hold these pieces together. Uh, a lot of Washington's other advisors at the time were saying the same thing, but Madison did agree to write a draft and delivered it to Washington. They didn't go through that many rounds of revisions at that point because Washington did decide to put it in a drawer and he decided to serve for another term. But by the time he got to 1796, there was absolutely no convincing him that he was going home no matter what, no matter what anyone said, no matter what the what sort of the co consequences were or the circumstances were on the ground. So in early 1796, probably around January 1st, Washington convened a cabinet meeting with his then secretaries. So sort of in a circle, there's Secretary of State Timothy Pickering, uh, the Attorney General Charles Lee, uh, Secretary of the Treasury Oliver Wolcott Jr., and then Secretary of War James McHenry. And this was his second set of secretaries. I affectionately refer to them as the B team talk a little bit about in the first book. Uh, Washington didn't like them very much, didn't like them nearly as much as the first crew, and didn't meet with them all that often. But on this particular day, he did meet with them. And the reason he met with them is because he wanted to tell them that he was planning to retire for good, no take backsies, and kind of to keep it a secret. But as in, uh, as in 2021, there are, it's really hard to keep a secret in Washington. And so news about this began to slowly trickle out. In February of um, in February of 1796, Alexander Hamilton came to Philadelphia to try a case in front of the Supreme Court. He was actually representing the United States in a tax case, and he uh, was charged with uh, arguing in front of the Supreme Court, which met in this building. This was the first Supreme Court, and they met in this room which was on the first floor of that particular building. Uh, apparently the case, Alexander Hamilton's argument was such a feature of that particular week that Congress, no one was actually in the Congress building next door. Everyone basically left and went to go hear the case. As he was sometimes wont to do, Hamilton talked for three hours, which I don't think would be permitted in oral arguments today. Um, but he apparently kept everyone's attention. All of the newspaper reports glowed about his arguments and how riveting they were. After Hamilton wrapped up his case, he went to go visit with Washington, as he usually did when he was in town. 
and he would have visited Washington at the president's house, which was on 6th and Market or 6th and High Streets, uh, just basically right around the corner from where the Supreme Court met. Unfortunately, that building no longer stands today, but this is roughly what it would have looked like, a 3D recreated version of it. On the, I don't know if you guys can see my little hand mouse, but on the second floor, there's a little alcove, a little brick alcove that juts out. That's where the president's private study would have been. And it would have looked something like this. It would have been absolutely stuffed full of furniture. There were at least three mahogany bookcases, Washington's giant French desk, which was about five feet wide, his dressing table, uh, his globe. Um, there was a stove in the corner, his uncommon chair. A lot of these items are actually still in the Mount Vernon collection. But Washington invited Hamilton to come into his private study and he shared with him that he was indeed planning to retire. The rumors were true. Again, Hamilton tried to convince him that this was impossible. He had to stay. The country wouldn't survive without him. Washington would not be convinced. And he asked Hamilton to draft up a farewell address. He gave him a list of some of the topics that he wanted to discuss, sort of general guidelines about the tone and what he wanted to convey. And then he handed over the copy of Madison's address from several years prior. And he instructed Hamilton to include a couple of paragraphs, basically copied and pasted from Madison's address. Uh, Hamilton agreed to do so. He left, he went back to New York City. He started working on his draft. He sent copies back and forth to Washington. It's hard to tell from their letters, but it seems like maybe he actually left the Madison letter with Washington because then Washington sent it to him later and reminded Hamilton how important it was to keep a couple of those paragraphs in that address. And the reason Washington did so was as follows. By 1796, it was pretty clear that there was an opposition party. Thomas Jefferson and James Madison were sort of the uh, non-official official heads of that new party. Washington knew that they were incredibly critical of a lot of things that his administration had done, and he suspected that they would be critical of this farewell address. He figured by including a couple of those paragraphs that it was almost a shot across the bow to warn them against criticizing this action, because first of all, they had known about it. They had known he planned to retire several years before and couldn't quibble with that statement. They had also helped draft it. They hadn't objected to the concept of a farewell address. So it was really politically savvy to include those paragraphs. And let me assure you, I'm sort of getting ahead of myself here, but Madison and Jefferson knew exactly what he was doing. This message did not go missed. So Hamilton goes back to New York City. He's working on his drafts. He's sending them back and forth to Washington. Once he feels like he has them in a good place, Washington and Hamilton agree that they should bring in one other set of eyes. So Hamilton arranges to go meet with John Jay, who was at that point, the governor of New York. At this point, the capital of New York was still in New York City and the governor's mansion was at one Broadway. It overlooked the Bowling Green and the Harbor. It was this beautiful brick mansion that had a view of the water from every single window. It was incredibly ornate. And Hamilton went and visited Jay at this mansion and they worked through the farewell address, both in writing but also verbally, they read it out loud because they understood that in American culture at the time, it was very important that words sounded good. Basically, if you read them out loud, because these newspapers would be shared among family members, they would be read by the fireside, and they would also be read at places like coffee houses and taverns. It was pretty common practice for travelers to stop at taverns or coffee houses to hear about the recent news especially if they were illiterate. It was a way to participate in the political culture if you couldn't read or if you couldn't afford to buy a newspaper. So it was equally as important that these words sounded great when spoken in addition to when reading. So when Jay finally felt like they had you know, a good handle on what was being said, he suggested that maybe they run it by someone else. And at that point, Hamilton was like, no, too many cooks in the kitchen. And he said that he felt good about it. He sent it back to Washington and he encouraged Washington to hold on to it as long as possible. Washington had originally intended to publish this farewell address at the end of the congressional session in June. When Hamilton finally sent it back to him, pretty sure Hamilton dawdled a bit and stalled. He finally sent it back to him in August 
And Washington then went through it and made some additional tweaks, added some additional lines. So it was very much his creation, not just Hamilton's. And then he did finally meet with a publisher to publish it in September. But Hamilton knew that when Washington finally made this announcement, it was basically going to be the start of a campaign season. And the Democratic Republicans, led by Jefferson and Madison, couldn't campaign against Washington. No one could campaign against Washington. And so they had to basically wait and see what happened, wait and see until this address came out or until he officially made an announcement until they could actually organize and put together their own campaign. And so Hamilton knew that it would be a really good idea to try and stall that process as long as possible to sort of hinder them and give the Federalists a running head start. So Washington got back the draft from Hamilton. He had kept that, this address a secret for the duration of the summer. He then convened another cabinet meeting in September with his B team and told them he had this address and that he planned to publish it and asked for their input about which newspaper would be the best choice. They decided to go with Claypool's Daily Advisor because it was as nonpartisan as, non as newspapers could be at the time, partly because Claypool had a lot of the government contracts. So that was a, a way for him to pay his costs without having to be as sort of virulent as uh, either the Federalist or the Republican newspapers. So they hoped that by having sort of a nonpartisan newspaper, more people would hear it. And then, of course, other newspapers would pick it up. So once Washington made this announcement, he sent Tobias Lear to Claypool. Tobias Lear was his um, sort of his chief secretary, almost kind of like chief of staff um, at the time. And uh, Tobias Lear delivered a message to Claypool saying that the president would like to see you. Again, when the president says he wants to see you, you show up. So Claypool, um, I, I just wanted, I, I wanted to mention that um, when the cabinet met, they also met in this room. So this was sort of the original cabinet room, if you will. When Claypool came to the president's house, he met with Washington in the drawing room. So when it wasn't the cabinet, it was in a more public social space. And Washington shared with him that he wanted to print this address. He wanted it to be done as soon as possible. And it was on the lengthier side. Uh, not quite the short little snippet op-eds that usually newspapers ran. Claypool took the draft. He went back to his office. This was a Saturday. He basically worked throughout the night to set it because, of course, all of it had to be set in print. He brought back a basically a proof copy for Washington to look at. He made a couple of adjustments. Claypool went back on Sunday evening ran uh, the print and all of the copies were delivered on September 19th, 1796. Now, just as these copies were going out in the morning of 1790, on September 19th, 1796, Washington left town. He went home, he went back to Mount Vernon. He did not want to be there. Um, I suspect partly because he wanted to make it very clear that this was not supposed to be a political statement. It was supposed to be a statement of retirement. So being out of town was helpful. Um, and he didn't really also want to hear any criticism that maybe would have come for the farewell address. So um, just a little bit of context at the time about why Washington necessarily would have wanted to do this farewell address. What were some of the circumstances he was speaking to? So uh, the picture on the right is of Philadelphia in the 1790s. I suspect that this is a little bit of a fanciful version because it doesn't really take into account the smells, the lack of sewage, the lack of garbage disposal, et cetera, et cetera. Um, additionally, Philadelphia in the 1790s was more dense in terms of population per square foot than New York City is today. So it would have been packed with people all the time, especially down by the wharf. In the 1790s, as Washington was leaving, France was still sort of in the middle of its French Revolution. There was constant ongoing warfare in Europe. Uh, there had been, of course, the guillotining of the uh, French king and queen, and that had led to the reign of terror that had subsided a bit, but things were still quite unstable. Uh, the French Navy was starting to attack American ships with increasing uh, ferocity in response to the Jay Treaty, which they felt was an abrogation of their alliance from the Revolutionary War. Happy to talk about some of those details more in the question and answer portion, if that would be helpful. So that's sort of the international sphere of things. Domestically, there is increasing partisan divide and partisan animosity 
the growth of sort of the nascent baby political parties and, and, and really serious, serious fights. In March and April, just a couple months prior, Congress had nearly disintegrated over debates about the Jay Treaty and the House's initial reluctance and refusal to fund a portion of that treaty. And there had been sort of a constitutional standoff over its role in the treaty making process, which was finally concluded when Washington asserted executive privilege for the first time. And then finally the House after several weeks of sort of plain chicken blinked first. Um, but Adams at the time wrote in his letters back to Abigail that he thought that the country was going to dissolve into civil war within 10 years. And he wasn't sure if the constitution was going to survive. So they really felt like the country was on the brink. There were constant threats of political violence. Um, actual political violence devolved in the next couple of years on, in the floor on the uh, House of Representatives and in the Senate. There were threats of arson and mob violence such that in places like New York City, they often would basically um, implement a draft to make all able-bodied men participate in night watches. Um, so, you know, it was uh, a really intense time on top of which there were concerns about nativism and immigrants and xenophobia and pandemics. So some of these things probably sound a little bit familiar. Washington understood that this, that this was incredibly tumultuous and it was going to be incredibly tumultuous no matter what, whenever he left office. Anytime the first president left office was going to be a calamity. He believed firmly that it had to happen while he was alive because the American people had to learn how to elect a new president. They had to learn how to transition. They had to learn how to have a peaceful transfer of power. This was not a practice that was custom in Europe. It was not something they had inherited. And so it was going to be incredibly stressful and him being alive such that it could be planned, that he would make the announcement, it would be very clear, there would be elections, that would help facilitate the process. And his presence would lend an air of legitimacy to uh, the transfer of power, to the election, and to whoever came next. So that was sort of Washington's process. That was what he was thinking about, some of the challenges on his mind. Uh, you know, we, at least until January, we took uh, transfers of power, peaceful transfers of power, and peaceful transitions for granted. They absolutely did not. They were very concerned that it would all go awry and one wrong step would lead to the end of the nation, which sounds hyperbolic, but not really. Look at how the French Revol Revolution had gone. You know, There were definitely worst case scenarios that they were concerned about. So just a couple of key points that I think are really worth highlighting. So the first is Washington talks about the centrality of the union, the importance of having not a confederation, a union, which was much stronger and much uh, more permanent than a confederation. And he says this long before the Civil War, which is when we typically think about this sort of rhetoric. He makes an argument for why the union is helpful, why it's in everyone's best interest financially, politically, internationally, diplomatically, militarily to have a union and why they can really benefit from having all of these regions tied together. He talks about the importance of um, defending and following the constitution, rejecting innovation or intrigue that's designed to undermine the constitution or weaken the party structure. He believes that the constitution creates this very strong federal government and a strong executive. And any attempt to undermine that is an attempt to undermine the liberty. He makes an argument that rules and laws and constitutional limitations are actually essential to liberty. Of course, the last two are probably more familiar to you and to your students. He talks about the dangers of party spirit. Now, he doesn't necessarily talk so much about the dangers of political parties as operations, but rather as a tool to drive wedges between different regions, between different types of Americans. And he harkens back to this theme again and again that Northerners and Southerners and Easterners and Westerners, New Yorkers and South Carolinians have more in common than they have apart. And party spirit serves to obscure those similarities and try to highlight the differences. Lastly, he talks about the dangers of foreign attachments. Now, the concept of entangling alliances 
is a phrase that he does not use. So we will uh, look for that. I always encourage uh, teachers to have students look for that phrase. Spoiler alert, it cannot be found. He was sort of saying two things with this foreign attachments piece. One, of course, yes, having long-term alliances is dangerous because it allows for countries to try and drag you into a conflict you don't want to be in. This was something he had learned in 1793 when France declared war on Great Britain and expected the United States to step up. But more importantly, it's this concept again of if you have an attachment to a foreign nation, it's not going to allow you to think clearly. It's going to cause you to have emotions for a foreign nation instead of an emotional attachment to your fellow American. So it's very important not to feel more strongly about Britain or France than say your fellow citizen. So it was very important to him that people tried to reject things that would, would allow them to forget about their similarities to one another. 